Okay, here we go, people. Are Mormon temple st ceremonies stolen from the Masons? This video was produced by Saints Unscripted. So it's uh, the guy I referred to recently as Dishonest Dave, I believe, or Deceptive Dave. And a guest who's got his own channel that Dave is very impressed with. So, this is a big topic, and let's just start off and notice how they set up a straw man right at the beginning. Oh, by the way, let's keep this in portrait mode on your phone for best viewing, and then you can just, uh, you know, give it full size. That's that's probably going to be the best way to view this, because that's how I'm, that's how I'm, doing it okay so landscape is not going to be the greatest way so the straw man are mormon temple ceremonies mormon temple ceremonies stolen from the masons okay so then what they're going to try to do is the same kind of crap that scott gordon of uh fair mormon tried and whom i ruined uh when in his uh, thing in Italy, when when he said when he tries to basically show, hey, there's differences between Freemasonry and Mormonism, therefore, Mormonism is still true. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, so so that's a false. Th this is a false premise. What we should be looking at is, are the tenants. Uh, uh, of, of LDS truth and authority claims valid or not, which would tell us that the, that the, 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 the LDS church is the one true church of the Israelite God, meaning that they have prophets and apostles representing, speaking for and with and on behalf of an all-knowing, unchanging, righteous, virtuous God. Is that the case? Or do we find violation of that premise within the presentation of the endowment in LDS temples? That is the real question. So once again, they're going to try to confuse the issue, uh, set up the straw man, and then make it look like, hey, Joseph Smith is a great prophet of this wonderful LDS God. And I'm going to point out their deception. Let's do this. Welcome to another episode of Saints Unscripted. This one is a little different because I look like a gamer and I feel like a gamer. It's kind of cool. We've got uh, a guest on the show today. His name is Brett McDonald. And yeah, Brett, you're in, are you in California? Yeah, Southern California. Southern California. So we're on a, a call with him online and uh i'm very excited well isn't that special so we got a gamer with his uh walmart uh headset just like one i've got and we got another guy from southern california just like me i'm just almost bonding with these guys already except not okay let's go excited for this episode he's so excited because Brett doesn't know this, but I am a big fan of his YouTube channel, LDS Truth. He has a boy crush on him. So right off the bat, we are. This is better. This is better than the bromance between uh, Ted Cruz and Donald Trump long ago. Truth claims. Sorry for the terrible music. It's not my fault. We're super excited to have you. I've kind of been a behind-the-scenes fan for a while. Can I have and, your autograph? Uh, what I like about your channel is just that, like, it's not... Like, for us, we've got this whole set, and, you know, we're trying to be funny and stuff, but, like, for you, like, you're not trying to be flashy. It's very raw. You're just there with a TV screen with slides on it, and you're just giving people the information. It's it's almost the like I said it's the opposite approach where um, I'm gonna try and bore you a little bit and it, there, it, it's like a tough love approach like if you really wanna you really wanna understand these things like I'm not gonna I, I yeah you, you're you're right and and partly that's because I'm not very uh, uh, artistic and, and good at those good at those things and and partly it's because just the nature of it so you're right it, it's um, it can be 
my wife always says the first one's the most difficult uh, session. It's all about epistemology and, and philosophy, which I loved, but she thought it was like so boring. She's like, she always tells people, get through the first one and then it gets better. But <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it's a, it, it takes a certain type of person, um, but uh, we all learn in different ways. Okay, please. Just because these guys are boring to start off with doesn't mean we're not going to get to something very important. And uh, just because it's early morning and I've been awake for a long time and I'm being a bit of a, well, I'm not going to say it. Hang in there. This will be important information, I think. So, yeah, I think it's all right. Great. So, uh, I want to talk today about uh, an extremely controversial topic, uh, and that is some of the criticisms related to Joseph Smith and Freemasonry. And I know that uh, you have at least one video on your channel about this, and I've seen it, uh, I think, more than once. Um, we don't have a ton of time to talk about it right now, so I would redirect anyone with uh, in our audience with uh, deeper questions about this to check out his video on it. We'll put a link to the to it in the description because uh, that's a solid, you know, 50 minutes or so of really good information. But just to jump right in, um, Brett, so one of the major criticisms of Joseph Smith is that because there are so many specific similarities with Freemasonry in our temple ceremonies, specifically the endowment ceremony, um, Joseph's claim that the ceremony was of divine origin or revealed to him by God, uh, a lot of people assume that must be false, and he must have just plagiarized things from Masonry. What's your take on that? Can you tell me specifically anything that... Uh, the the ideas that uh, you would say, or, or when you talk to people, they say are plagiarized. Well, there's so so there's obviously a difference between um, like the endowment ordinance per se and the presentation of the endowment, or just kind of the. Uh, I mean, it is a, a, a the, theatrical presentation to a certain extent, and there are a lot of similarities in the theatricality about it. But I think what is more concerning to people are the specific, you know signs or, or things that we do in the ordinances that concern people. Yeah, it's, what's, what's really interesting, and the reason I asked you that question is that um, it, it, I couldn't do this in my presentation, but when I talk to folks individually, um, I really like to ask questions because um, oftentimes what I find is that maybe they've literally like, I don't know, read a website or something. Um, and. And so what concerns me is um, it is a lack of understanding about both topics, both, both where the temple came from and masonry. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really difficult sometimes to even have a, a conversation with, with people. Because um, you're operating so, on different foundational totally, premises. Totally different way. So, so for instance, why is it, do you think, that this was not a criticism of the early church? So Joseph Smith, two months after being elevated to a master mason um, does the first endowment in the same place where he was initiated as a mason. Now, why is it, do you think, that all those early people that went through both, because there was tons of crossover, um, you know, the masons got angry at the Mormons because too many of them were becoming masons, um, and that there was a schism for about 100 years there between the, the two organizations. But um, there was massive amounts of, of church members that were becoming Masons and then also going through Joseph's temple initiation. So, so the question is, the people that were closest to both, um, to both traditions, why is it that they had no concern over the idea of, uh, you know, of, of Joseph presenting his, uh, his endowment? And I would suggest the reason they had no concern, and this concern comes later from people that have really no understanding of either, of either tradition, um, is that Joseph's, Joseph's initiation is clearly a response to masonry. Um, but that was really the nature of all of his revelation, right? So think about how we get the Book of Abraham. Right. Mm -hmm. Book of Abraham, he, he's intrigued by these mummies and, and scrolls that he finds. And boom, he, he produces the Book of Abraham. How do we get the Book of Moses and particularly the Book of Enoch um, that we have in our uh, in our uh, Pearly Great Price? Well, he's retranslating the Old Testament and boom, out comes, you know, a, a portion of the Book of Enoch. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so <clears throat> I, I feel like they're deflecting here, and so he's going to he's going to uh, try to uh, rationalize that Joseph Smith has a revelatory process that um, makes it okay that he joins this Luciferian religion of Freemasonry. Of course, he's not going to mention that it's a Luciferian religion, at least not in the portion of this that I viewed before I started this, which was uh, probably less than half uh, of, of, the, of, of their presentation. So does that make it okay? No, we still have the same. We still have the same situation. We've got the LDS Truth and Authority claims that Joseph Smith is representing an honest God, an all-knowing and unchanging God, and that He has access to direct revelation from Him. And and we see over and over that there is also a pattern of Him going to the Lord, as we are told, uh, for answers. Uh, even for people's lives, you know, where should I serve a mission, that sort of a thing. But now he's saying that <clears throat> this came because it's a response to Freemasonry, a response. Um, and, and, and why were people not bothered? I don't know. Maybe people were bothered. That's an assumption that he's making. Uh, Heber C. Kimball called, uh, called the Temple Endowment um, Celestialized Masonry. People were very gullible. Joseph Smith and uh, Sidney Rigdon took off uh, in around 1835 after the Kirtland uh, fake bank failed. They took off to Canada, and when they came back, about half the uh, members of the church were now following a 16-year-old girl using a magic rock, another a magic seer stone. Um, so... the. If those people weren't worried about it, that doesn't really change. That doesn't change anything. So he, he's kind of obfuscating the point. The point is that Joseph Smith did copy a number of things from Freemasonry. Freemasonry is a Luciferian religion. It is a religion. And the God of Freemasonry is proclaimed by top Masonic leaders in Masonic literature to be Lucifer. Okay, so for the Mormon prophet, the prophet of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as Kwaku likes to call it, which is uh, in harmony with what the LDS leaders would say, included the fact that instead of going straight to this Israelite God for a revelation on how to empower or endow the members of the church or the saints with power from on high, he wound up in the process of that joining a another religion. Remember, he had been commanded to go not after them when we are referencing other religious leaders. Those were Christian leaders. These, these things are coming from Freemasonry whose God is proclaimed to be Lucifer. So he goes to the Luciferian religious leaders. He goes and he joins their sect. He joins and becomes a Freemason. He makes vows that are connected uh, <laughs> to this religion with demonic oaths, which he brought into Mormonism, into the endowment. So, yeah, these, these are problems. These are problems that bothered me a great deal in my waking up process. I had to, I prayed and prayed and prayed for some sort of enlightenment as to how I could poss possibly reconcile the fact that Joseph Smith with all his ability to go ask this dear Heavenly Father or Jesus Christ, his Son, for answers about what we should eat, what we should drink, where we should go on missions, all these sorts of things, had to join the Masonic religion to come up with the signs and tokens of the Holy Priesthood, which Brigham Young said were necessary to pass by the angels who stand as sentinels and receive our exaltation in spite of earth and hell, if I'm quoting that correctly. So 
these supposedly were necessary uh, signs and tokens given, which, yes, are brought into the LDS endowment in connection with each other and with covenants that are made uh, specifically such as the covenants uh, in, in relation to um, promising to obey the law of the gospel as it is given in the temple, the law of sacrifice, the law of chastity, and the law of consecration. And so Masonic signs, tokens, and demonic penalties from Freemasonry are all tied in and associated individually with various, uh, well, with these four so-called laws uh, that you are covenanting to obey in the endowment. So, yeah, these are big problems. Oh, by the way, the book of Abraham, he says, like, voila, Joseph Smith comes up with a book of Abraham, as if it's, like, inspired uh, by an all-knowing, unchanging God. All kinds of anachronisms, linguistic anachronisms, historical anachronisms, false definitions. I've done, you know, various videos on it. And then, of course, here in the facsimile 2 from the Book of Abraham, Joseph Smith says he has translated it. Egyptologists have a completely different translation. But Joseph Smith's translation, and we see this arrow, we see this orange, you know, square here. And it's pointing to where it came because it, from because it's upside down in that portion of this circular facsimile what we see okay here and what is this uh this guy with the bird head sitting on a chair or a throne and joseph smith says this is god the father or elohim sitting on his throne and he's talking to two male figures there in this, the Holy Ghost and Abraham, and he's talking about the grand key words of the priesthood. But you'll notice that God doesn't have clothes on, and he has, as he's in a state of sexual excitement talking to two dudes. This is like gay porn. I won't worship this God. This is like the gayest thing I've ever seen in my life. That's disgusting. So, that's Joseph Smith's voila inspiration, according to this guy. But that's the kind of stuff that this guy is using here to, to say, okay, great, you know. Joseph Smith looks at these uh, papyri that have nothing to do with uh, Abraham, and voila, God inspires him to interpret them as uh, God talking to the Holy Ghost and uh, Abraham in a state of sexual excitement and naked. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not impressed. Let's continue. So similarly, it, the same thing happens with the first vision. He has a question about this other thing and then boom, the restoration yeah. comes from it. So, so ac ac actually that's not true. And just did a video on that. Voila. No, he made that shit up many years later. That's why in 1838, we've got the first that we've heard about this God, the father in Jesus Christ vision. And, uh, no one ever heard of it before then, though he said he was persecuted and of course, it contradicts the the histor the history of the Smith family. And uh, please refer to the recent. Uh, uh, please refer to my page uh, on that. Um, and, and I'll throw the links in there to the Mormon Truth videos, Gospel topics. Up there's a page devoted specifically to that. So what we have once again is these guys are throwing down stuff as as though it's supporting evidence. Of, of the of their tenant and it's not it's not supporting what they're saying these are not great and true revelations joseph smith was not interested in religion at all in 1820 that we can see in 1823 supposedly according to the history of the church as given by joseph smith and oliver cowdery uh in the times and seasons in 1823 he was praying to find out if God, if a God, or if a supreme deity, a supreme being, in his, in the words that we have there, even existed. Yeah, so watch that video, look at that webpage. Um, these guys are, 
are, are just spewing trash that is not actually supportive of, of their claims when you investigate it. First idea, the first the first concept is just this, this idea of what we, what do we mean by revelation? It is is revelation in, in our tradition? Does it happen that you know God, whatever divine being, just shows up on someone's doorstep that has no interest? He's a Mormon saying God, whatever, some divine being interest in anything, right? And he's like, here here it is. Well, in our tradition, that's really not what we see at all. In fact, what we see is this dialogue between humans and and the divine I, I would point to even the mistakes in our tradition like the priesthood ban which was clearly you know a, a, a racist policy because the members of the church were racist and what did it take to overcome that well it took a large enough portion of people in authority to go to god and really really get there and, and overturn that in other words often people say why wasn't it immediately struck down? Why didn't God immediately come down and say, this is wrong and you should change it? Well, what we see is that like, we're largely left on our own to a large extent, mm -hmm. and that includes people in authority, includes people with prophetic authority. Okay, so basically there's no reason to have a prophet uh, or, or have him claim that he speaks for a just, true, holy, unchanging, and all-knowing God, because for all people's entire lifetimes, according to what this guy is just telling us, uh, they were just led to believe uh, some BS uh, regarding the, the worthiness of Negroes to hold the priesthood in Mormonism. So just because uh, uh, what a majority of the apostles uh, didn't were, were racist, uh, they couldn't get a revelation. That, that was accurate seriously we had like a dozen uh presidents of the church uh, uh, coming in line with this well first of all let's go back it wasn't just because some guy was racist and he's referring to brigham young no doubt um we can look in lds scripture we can look in the joseph smith translation of the bible genesis chapter 9 genesis chapter 7 Seven is in the Pearl of Great Price. Nine is not. They only go to the first eight. He says that uh, God turned... Well, he says what? The, the Canaanites were turned black after killing the people of Shem so that all people could despise them. That's why they became black. Oh, and in, section, in, in, in chapter nine, Joseph Smith changes Genesis to tell us that the way we can identify the uh, people who are supposed to be slaves to the Jews, in other words, the seed of Ham... The, the seed of Canaan, Canaan and his seed, basically, the way we can identify them is because they're dark, because a, a veil of darkness was placed upon them that all men might know him, right after it says that he was to serve his brother Shem, the Semites, the Jews. So um, this didn't just come from racist Brigham Young, it came from uh, Joseph Smith's inspired translation of the Bible and the book of Abraham where specifically the Canaanites are are forbidden to have the priesthood and of course that used to link in LDS um, uh, on LDS.org and and in uh, the printed scriptures uh, between Abraham chapter 1 where it says the Canaanites cannot have the priesthood because they are cursed of God to Moses chapter 7, where it identifies the Canaanites as black. Mm hmm. All right. Nice try, guys. Your dishonesty is well noted. And things come in response to uh, response to our questions and response to our, our concerns. So, um, again, that's a long answer, but I think it goes to the very thesis of Revelation. If people are saying... You know, the, the the temple ordinance needed to come out of a, a lightning bolt and, and not be in response to anything. Well, that's just incorrect according to everything we see in the tradition. So the first answer... Okay, now we're going to dramatize that and say it had to come out of a lightning bolt. Okay, well, we say that the first vision came out of Joseph Smith just asked God on his first prayer, which church to join? Okay, even though he never said anything about that until like 1838. 
1832, he wrote something down that had nothing to do with a vision with a God the Father and Jesus Christ. It was mainly about him having his sins forgiven. You should actually read the whole things. So, does it have to be a lightning bolt? No, it doesn't have to be a lightning bolt, but Joseph Smith asks and God answers. Time after time, that's what we're told, but now he has to join a Luciferian religion. Join it. Join it. Not you know, become a member and swear demonic oaths, okay, of death, of secrecy, having to do with the signs and tokens of Freemasonry, which he then brings in to the LDS endowment, which is why we had so many LDS people joining Freemasonry so that Joseph Smith would not be breaking his Masonic oaths when revealing or using these signs and tokens in in the LDS endowment by giving them to non-initiated people. That's why they initiated people. That's why they were making Masons, as they called it, or in other words, making Master Masons, people having to be raised, not elevated, but raised to the third degree. Maybe you can use those words interchangeably, but, but he was raised to the third degree, raised to the sublime degree, the degree of Master Mason, and he was raising others to the degree of Master Mason before using the uh, patriarchal grip uh, <laughs> and the others, you know, grips that we call the, you know, the, 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 the tokens of the, of the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood, which he was copying right out of uh, Freemasonry, out of the Blue Lodge, Fellow Craft, you know, Entered Apprentice, Master Mason, things uh, that were associated with those degrees of Freemasonry in terms of, of uh, tokens and signs, which Brigham Young said the angels had to uh, test you on before you get into heaven. <laughs> so you got to have a prophet join a Luciferian religion and then have a bunch of other guys join this Luciferian religion so that he won't be killed by the Masons, um, at least right away. For stealing their stuff to use in the LDS endowment. So God should have just revealed this straight to Joseph Smith or sent Angel Moroni or Angel Nephi or, you know, one of these guys, Elijah, somebody down there to, to show him this stuff and, and give him these signs and tokens if they were the same ones that the Masons were using rather than make him uh, join a Luciferian religion and enter into their wickedness. Sir, is look, nobody close to the situation had a concern with this, and the reason reason for that is because um, this is how this is the world they operated in. They understood Joseph to be um, getting these things based on his experience with other traditions, and so clearly our endowment to me, when I see it, is a response to masonry, not a copy of it. So, for example, we, there are some identical features. Uh, five points of fellowship, for example. Um, others are the symbol of the compass and the square you'll see in both traditions. And then there's similarities in what I would call ritual style. And I list a ton of those in pre presentations that I go through. I won't go through all of them, but things like, you know, using a set script, um, imparting signs, scripts, uh, passwords to initiates. So those are similarities in ritual style, but we don't see exact similarities there's very few in fact exact similarities um yeah so that's not that important so in, in masonry they're going to go knock 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 you know with a mallet or, and they're going to go knock 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 in mormonism what is wanted uh very similar language there you know someone having been you know enlightened or initiated or adam having kept the commandments desires more light and knowledge through the you know uh, from the lord through the veil that's very similar to the language they're going to get in freemasonry it's obviously copied or inspired copied and then slightly altered once again the signs and tokens that are supposed to be so holy you can't get into heaven without them are copied right out of freemasonry and once again if you've got to join 
a Luciferian religion to get this stuff. Why are why are you a prophet? Why can't you just get it from God straight on? You know, why do you have to join the Masons? Uh, two of the grips are exact similarities, symbol of the compass square I mentioned, um, has it a name, there's some specific wordings that is. And then there's a lot of similarities in style. But then the, the, the two traditions really separate really dramatically. Um, you know, if you know about me. Which doesn't matter at all. The point is he joined a Luciferian religion to get some portion of the LDS endowment. That's the point. If he had direct access to revelation from this God through his magic stone, dedicated, consecrated, and, and set apart through witchcraft, which is what activates seer stones in the magic world in the first place, then he wouldn't need to join these Satanists. Oh, yes. Am I jumping there? No, not really. I am and I'm not. Because though Lucifer is not Satan, as far as what we have in the Bible link linking it, and though they say that Lucifer is the god of light and good and all that stuff in Freemasonry in their open teachings, these men at the top are the same Freemasons that are guiding the Mormon cult and Christianity and the JWs, SDA, all, all of these religions are, are led by occultists. Most of these top leaders are Freemasons. I don't care. You know, you can go back in time and you can, I, you see the videos I've done, whoever it is, right? Oral Roberts, Pat Robertson, um, you know, guy that died not that long ago. God, he was a horrible individual um, who got his backing through another wicked man, William Randolph Hearst. Yeah, I'm talking about Billy Graham. So, once again, we've always got these occultists guiding all of these religions um, who, that are influential in, in, in the Abrahamic um, traditions. Why? Bigger story. Other videos. Secret combinations. It's all about a murder of a particular person, right? Our ritual drama is about the creation of the world and... and um, and morality of, of humans and covenants to, to God. So, um, so I just, again, I, I would ask people if they're dealing with these things first to understand both traditions a little bit more, um, to understand the Once again, doesn't matter. There are differences. Yes. The presentation of the endowment, you're making covenants, uh, related to, uh, things that uh, serve the LDS church. I, in other words, promising to give everything you, uh, are asked to the brethren uh, in the law of consecration for instance the dramatization of the garden of eden uh you know jewish uh, mythology from the bible well actually it's you know for whatever from, from from the from the pentateuch copied into the bible stolen by the catholic church so um you've got that versus the legend of hiram abiff which is the murder that he alluded to I, i've mentioned in other videos i was in the temple in the endowment session and uh spoken to by an unseen being and told google the five points of fellowship now, i was familiar with the five points of fellowship because i had received my endowments previous to the uh changes that that occurred after uh you know, the 1990 somewhere, maybe it was April 1990, was that where it was? <clears throat> I was familiar with the, with the five points of fellowship, but when I googled it, according to the whisperings of whatever spirit spoke to me, I found nothing about Mormonism that came up in, in my Google search. What I found was how, all having to do with the legend of Hiram Abeth, which is what he's referring to. It was all Freemasonry. Once again, I and that was one of those things that caused me to say, why is this stuff all coming from Freemasonry? Or so much of it. Like I said, Genesis didn't come out of Freemasonry. So freaking what? It, we're, the question is not, as they want us to pretend that it is, the question is not, is Freemasonry identical in every way with Mormonism and the Temple Endowment? 
The question is, did Joseph Smith have access to the God of Israel or not, with in, 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 in which he claimed to, or did he have to join this secretive society filled with iniquity in order to gain things which are supposed to li supposedly the most holy and sacred things in Mormonism presented in the endowment? I mean, he, 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 he could ask God, and God tells him, you don't drink hot drinks, you know. Um, straight up, just because Emma doesn't like the guys uh, spitting all over the place, and she has to clean their crap up. But when it comes to the most sacred things, no, he has to join this Luciferian cult. Okay, now, some of you are saying, Luciferian, where can you document that, Dodger? Let's go into that right now, okay? Let, let, let's make my case right now on that. We already looked at the book of Abraham just briefly enough to see that God is a total perv, okay? Now, here's some Masonic quotes. Lucifer, this is from Albert Pike. He's like the most celebrated Freemason of all time. You hear he's a 33rd degree Freemason. He was actually head of the Supreme Council of all the 33rd degree guys. Head of the Scottish Rite in uh, North America, uh, or the Southern Jurisdiction, and then all of uh, North America. Uh, I mean, you know, he, 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 he redid the, the, their ordinances or rites. Of, of the Scottish right, because they uh, were pissing off guys from the York right, which is the right that most of the people belonged to that uh, Joseph Smith was associated with, by the way. And um, he was also a York right Freemason. Um, I'm talking about Al Albert Pike. Uh, and, and I believe he, he attained higher honorary degrees, like the 95th degree or some shit. I, I, you know, most people never even heard of those. Anyway, um, Lucifer. The light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, it is he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable blinds the feeble, sensual, or selfish soul. Doubt it not. Okay, that's great. That's Albert Pike. But um, more importantly, let's go to uh, the last one here. Albert Pike, once again, in Morals and Dogma. That's like... You know, the, that was that was the book that was being given out for a hundred years to uh, Masons that reached like the 14th degree or something at least uh, to get the instruction from this Supreme Grand Commander, Sovereign Pontiff of Universal Freemasonry, it says here. Okay. And he's giving instructions to the 23 supreme councils of the entire world. This is being quoted in his book. And it says, That which we must say to the crowd is, We worship a god, but it is the god one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign grand inspectors, gen, inspector general, okay, we're talking 32nd degrees at least. We say this and you, we say this and you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. So this is only for high level guys. The Masonic religion, get that? The Masonic religion. Joe joined another religion, should be by all of us initiates of the high degrees maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. So, Joe Smith joined something, a religion that goes by the Luciferian doctrine, according to its grand poobah of that time, at least in the Americas. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, the God of the Christians, and <clears throat> whose deeds prove cruelty, paradophy, and hatred of man, barbarism and repulsion for science, all the things I pretty much agree with, Albert, on that, would Adonai and his priests calumniate him? Calumniate him? I, sorry, this is just not a word that I use. Yes, Lucifer is God. 
And unfortunately, Adonai, which means my Lord in Hebrew, by the way, and was the word used in the Bible by the Jews, uh, uh, other than the Elohim, which was also used to, so that they wouldn't be using Yahweh or the Tetragrammaton, YHWH. Okay, so this title, my Lord, was used for the Jewish God. So, yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai is also God. For the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black, for the absolute can only exist as two gods, darkness being necessary for the light to serve as its foil, and the pedestal is necessary to the statue and the brake to the locomotive. So what we're looking at there is that is pure Luciferian doctrine, and it's taught in the temple by Lucifer, saying, you know, we, you, you must learn to comprehend uh, uh, opposites. He's telling Eve, he's teaching Eve, you know, for you to know pleasure, you must know pain, uh, etc. And he goes through several examples there. And uh, that's this same Luciferian doctrine. And we find also that there must be opposition. And must, there must needs be opposition in all things. We find that quote in the Book of Mormon. And yes, we've got Luciferianism taught in the Book of Mormon. Okay. So, Lucifer is the, 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 the uh, worshipped god of Freemasonry. He's the good god. And the Hebrew God is the evil God, as proclaimed by their Grand Poobah, their Grand Inspector General Pontiff of the whatever, holy of holiest frickin'. Uh, yeah, it's ridiculous uh, how, how grandiose their titles can be. Okay, let's just show a couple more high-level Masonic codes. Palladism, Palladism, now that's a particular rite, by the way, I believe it was developed by Albert Pike. Palladism is necessary, is necessarily a Luciferian rite. Its religion is Manichean Neo-Gnosticism, teaching that the divinity is dual and that Lucifer is equal of Adonai with Lucifer, the god of light and goodness, struggling for humanity against Adonai, the Hebrew god, the god of darkness and evil. Albert Pike had only specified and unveiled the dogmas of, of the high grades of all other masonries, for in no matter what right the great architect, that's, who, that's the god of masonry, that's Lucifer. The great architect of the universe is not the God worshipped by Christians. Extract from Masonry Beyond the Light. Uh, that's Schnevelum. So he's a he's an apostate to Masonry. He's a born again Christian, but he is quoting accurately. Okay. Again, here we've got Lost Keys of Freemasonry, Manly Hall. Um, 30, 33rd degree Freemason, it says here. Now, that I mentioned his book, uh, Secret Teachings of All Ages, in uh, yesterday's video, didn't I? Uh, when the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onwards he, and upwards, he must prove his ability to properly apply this energy. What energy? The energy, the seething energies of Lucifer. Well, do I tell the truth or do I not, people? Okay, so... The Masonic religion is a Luciferian religion seeking to keep pure the Luciferian doctrines within that religion. And Joseph Smith joined that religion in order to obtain the first and second tokens of the Aaronic priesthood, the first and second tokens of the Melchizedek priesthood with their accompanying uh, signs and penalties. 
penalties such as slitting your throat, ripping your heart and your bowels out, having your tongue ripped out, all kinds of really horrific, nasty, satanic crap. Do we need more? And the nature of Revelation a little bit more. And then really what I get into is um, Joseph Smith makes very specific claims about the, the endowment. He says these things were had agently. They were had before Jesus was on earth. He says that Jesus had them and gave them to his earliest followers. Um, and we can now test that based on findings of ancient documents that we have um, throughout the word, in, world, including the Nag Hammadi and other agnostic texts. So what I do is I say, look, if Joseph, again, take the critical point of view, Joseph... Pretending that Jesus actually existed and is the guy described in these phony Gospels uh, that we have in the New Testament, there's n <laughs> the evidence is highly in favor of the fact that that never happened. Um, so this fictional Jesus character uh, giving this information is not important or relevant. Were these things had anciently? Very possibly they were. We see arguments saying that Freemasonry didn't exist way back then, but the same knowledge or the same this the the same uh, occult religious uh, practices were had in many instances, and there are new twists on them, and they may have been passed down through the Knights Templar and the Rosicrucians to the Freemasons. So could that have existed? Yes. So what? Once again, Joseph Smith joins a Luciferian um, religion when Lucifer is condemned in Christianity and Mormonism. And Lucifer is portrayed to be the same individual as Satan in Christianity, though it's not supported by the Bible, and in the LDS endowment. Joseph Smith's one of them, and they claim to worship Lucifer and that he's good, yet Joe makes him out to be the devil to please ignorant Christians in the endowment. is initiated into Freemasonry. He says, I'm going to, again, be, pretend I'm a prophet. Another way I'm going to pretend I'm a prophet is I'm going to, I'm going to steal this. I'm going to add some things, change some things and say, Hey, it's a revelation from God. But he's also going to make a very specific claim, which is that these things were had anciently. They were had in Jesus's time. Um, and again, another audacious claim. He makes a ton of audacious claims, right? From Enoch to the Book of Mormon, on and on. He, he's even from the very first start of the Book of Mormon, right? He takes the writings that he uh, copies and he sends them to the scholars to get them translated, right? He initially views himself not as the translator of the Book of Mormon because he had no clue how to translate anything, but as finding a way to get it translated. So in the fraud... He had no clue how to translate, yet we are told that he got the Book of Mormon translation word for word off of a magic stone. Once again, a stone that must be consecrated and set apart through witchcraft. I've read the spells, okay? This is freaking ridiculous how they twist all this shit. Unbelievable. Doesn't matter if it came from ancient date. Doesn't matter if he got some things right. Doesn't matter if it was revealed or channeled satanically. That doesn't make him a representative of an all-knowing unchanging, just, righteous, loving, forgiving, merciful God with all these good characteristics. None of this shit makes any of that true. I'm probably going to have to uh, part two this thing later to do the rest of it. It's uh, 6.09, and I don't want to make this video get too long, but I believe I've established my point. And let's take a look at where you can look more into this subject this is on my web page in my website my mormon truth videos gospel topics hub this page is uh, titled from ancient mystery schools through templars and masonry to danites and luciferian endowments all right i've got videos that are appropriate uh, for this particular subject integrated on the page they are you they, they are also housed on youtube but you can find them here 
you know, where they're involved, where, where they're placed with the category that, uh, you know, that, that they pertain to. Just a little here for me to read. I, I'll go ahead and share this. Uh, here we have, uh, you know, the, the witchcraft star and some occult uh, symbolism and uh, I'm basically portraying Lucifer there uh, with this priest. So, in the highest degrees of masonry are revealed the purest Luciferian doctrine according to some of the most celebrated and decorated 33-degree Freemasons such as Albert Pike and Manly Palmer Hall. However, even the common master mason has been given certain signs and tokens such as have been renamed for the LDS Temple Endowment, which up to this, which up until 1986 were protected by the gruesome demonic oaths within the lodge and made mention of through symbolic pantomime in the LDS endowment until 1990. So the endowment has has uh, evolved. In other words, uh, this the, this some of this masonry disappeared incrementally into the you know in in early 1990 they still had pantomiming of slitting the throat, ripping the heart out, and that sort of a thing, but you were no longer using the same words of the Masonic Oath. Um, you, you basically stated, rather than reveal these things, I would suffer my life to be taken, and then you pantomime slitting your throat, etc. Okay, when, and then in 1990, Gordon B. Hinckley followed suit uh, eventually followed suit of the uh, precedent set by his leaders in the craft in London, though they had been downgraded incrementally in Mormonism, which is what I just said, over the years since the times when blood atonement doctrine and the oath of vengeance upon the United States government were part of part and parcel of mainstream Mormonism in the days of the bloodthirsty Brigham Young and his cohorts. All right, so uh, what videos do we have there? The Hidden Teachings, uh, you know, it's got a longer name, I don't remember what it was. LDS Masonic Apologetics, that's a really good video, I think, uh, because the, 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 the Masonic Apologists are everywhere. They're on Reddit, they're everywhere, and they try to use all uh, this taxi, host, whatever thing, uh, hoax. They, they try all kinds of things to uh, try to separate Freemasonry from Luciferianism uh, and... Uh, you will see here in the, in that video how full of crap they are. All right, honest disclosure, Haley Everett's temple thing. Uh, do we as Mormons secretly worship Lucifer? Um, okay, and then we got a five-video review of a presentation made by uh, president of LES Apologetic Group, Fair Mormon. That would be Scott Scott Gordon, uh, which he made on Freemasonry and the Temple Endowment uh, in their relationship. And uh, it says, uh, brings to light not only the true nature of the Luciferian doctrines and rituals used to bind the saints to obedience to church leaders, but the mind control techniques that Scott uses to obfuscate the truth from gullible listeners. This is a five uh, video series that I did uh, exposing Scott Gordon for the liar he is as president of Fair Mormon. Uh, so, um,. I think I did a pretty fair job there, and uh, there's a lot you can learn about this subject, and so basically uh, I'm using this video I'm doing today as a gateway to uh, you learning more about this subject. Bottom line, Masonry and Mormonism don't have to be identical in the Temple Endowment or anywhere else for Joseph Smith to have been a copycat, putting a twist on things and not representing an all-knowing, unchanging, righteous God. I'm Dodger Dave. Please like, subscribe, support, do all kinds of stuff to get this out there. I've been shadow banned, obviously, by Google and YouTube and Mormons up there in the hierarchy. And your participation is very necessary to spread this. Adios, amigos. Dodger Dave illuminating blah 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 but the uh, temple endowment signs and tokens there at the bottom one um, if you haven't seen that you might find it interesting you'll see some of these signs and tokens uh, being uh, demonstrated why don't we just run that and I'll just leave on that just the beginning of it here
people you can see the rest of that one by uh, going into my channel and locating it it wasn't that long ago i'm out have a great day take action thanks <laughs>